Thank you, Larry. It's uh, a pleasure to be here, and the weather is still cooperating. It's really going to go home, I guess, with false impressions that it's totally sunny in Vancouver, just like it is in Irvine. What I'm going to do today is I want to, to basically go through a little bit on what's happening in laparoscopic urooncology. And I'm going to cover all of our urological cancers today, try and give you at least my overview, which gradually may well be biased, but I'm going to try not to be. But this is on its way out. Uh, big tumors, big incisions um, are, I think, are rapidly becoming a thing of the past. And that's because of the advent of laparoscopic surgery. We have the ability now with the camera technology that we have to basically see better than you could even see through an open incision. Uh, the ability of 30 degree lenses allows you to see things you could never see unless you really made a humongous incision. Even then, there are things you could not see that you can see with a 30 degree lens. The instrumentation that we have to bring to bear today, the technology we have with regard to bipolar equipment, uh, ligatures, harmonic spheres, uh, the new surgical pharmaceuticals, all have enabled us to do things that were unimaginable. But, you know, laparoscopy, like so much of everything else, goes back to urology. And if it weren't for Nietzsche's cystoscope, uh, Kelly would have had nothing to look in the abdomen in 1901 when he first discovered pneumoperitoneum. And likewise, Jacobius would have had nothing to look at the liver uh, in 1910 when he really put laparoscopy on the map. And it was Sam in 1980 that really blew the cover off of things with doing the first appendectomy. So here's a gynecologist doing the first laparoscopic appendectomy for which he was roundly condemned, kicked out of society, which is usually the harbinger of being welcomed back and honored, which he was. He just recently passed away. Newly, the same thing, did the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy in 87 and then was promptly expelled from most surgical societies in Germany. And fortunately, we didn't suffer the same fate when we did the nephrectomy in St. Louis. Um, but let's look at all of the GU cancers and go through them with regard to oncology. And the only one that is sort of off limits seems to be adrenal cancer. And I want to look at it from the standpoint of trying to decide should the a laparoscopic procedure or when should a laparoscopic procedure replace an open procedure. I think that point in time comes when what I call the four E's are fulfilled, that it's as or, or more efficacious, that it's as efficient, that it provides for better or equal equanimity with regard to postoperative pain, morbidity, hospital stay, and convalescence, and that it's economically feasible. So those are the four E's I kind of like to look at in trying to make that decision. And so let's look first at renal cancer. We first did this back in June of 1990, so now it's been literally uh, almost 14 years to the day since we did the first laparoscopic nephrectomy in an 85-year-old woman with a 5 centimeter tumor that turned out to be an oncocytoma. What I would like to call your attention to is that this was not a solitary or a singular effort. Uh, indeed, there are multiple disciplines that came together to make a jump forward. And this is the way it almost always is. If you can get a lot of people in different fields to share a vision, then you move forward. If there's only one person with the vision, then it doesn't go forward very rapidly, if at all. And so Nat Sofer in general surgery, Mike Darcy in interventional radiology, and then Fred Romer, Ed Pingleton, and Paul Thompson from Cook Urology as engineers all participated in order to make this a reality. And of course, I had the good fortune of working with Luke Zinsky at that time. Steve Dirks was our resident, Shimon Meritech was a fellow, and Stephanie Long, who's finishing her general surgery at Tulane at that point in time with our lab tech. The method hasn't changed that much. It's still basically a, a four or five sport approach on the right side, usually 312, and then these five as needed. An optional five on the right side in the uh, sub xiphoid area is very helpful for retracting the liver because the hilum's always underneath the liver. On the left side, you don't need this. Uh, we usually will insufflate laterally with the patient in the lateral decubitus position, either here off the iliac crest on the left side or here on the, on the right side. And there are a lot of variations on the theme. The hand assist device popularized by Steve Nicotta, Ernie Sosa, Stuart Wolf, I think has made a significant jump forward in that it's allowed a lot more people to do laparoscopic work. And the overall outcome of the hand assist is very similar to standard laparoscopy and it's far better with regard to patient comfort in the open. And there's no doubt that with a hand in the abdomen and this being your laparoscopic instrumentation, you can do a lot of things that you can't do uh, with standard laparoscopy. It makes it a lot easier because you have, if you will, um, a sensate uh, instrument inside the abdomen. 
Well, what does the literature show? Uh, up to 2001, over 600 cases. OR time, if you compare it to open, a little bit longer. But the blood loss is a lot less. The morphine sulfate equivalent for pain relief, a lot less. The hospitals stay less. Complications are less laparoscopically. Recovery much quicker. And the overall cancer survival seems to be equivalent on these seven series. If you look at the hand assist, a little less numbers, if you will, uh, but the OR time a little bit shorter, 3.6 hours. This is average morphine sulfate equivalents, very similar to what you saw in the open. Complications higher, and it's interesting, this is mostly due to wound complications. And there are a couple series showing wound complications at the 14% rate after hand assist. So I'm not sure what's going on there, whether it's just a lack of experience or just that the wound is, is more traumatized perhaps with the hand, I don't know, but that's what is reported out of Michigan and also out of college group in England. Hospital stays short, and again, short-term good results. Retroperitoneally, uh, Indy Gill and Claude Abu have put this on the map. Shorter OR time than with the standard laparoscopic or even a hand assist. Complications about the same. Hospital stay a little bit less, so another way of going. Indy did a great study where he compared transperitoneal to retroperitoneal in a prospective randomized clinical study, one of the rarest things you can find in the surgical literature. And at least in his hands, the retroperitoneal approach dropped the OR time by about 45 minutes. Uh, but overall, the blood loss, the hospital stay, the morphine sulfate equivalents were similar. They had a few more complications in their transperitoneal than in their retroperitoneal group. Follow-up wise, we were able to collect some information for five-year follow-up by pooling studies that we had in St. Louis, as well as Barrett and Fenty's work, uh, which has been excellent in Saskatoon and then Yoshinara Ono in Nagoya. And what we were able to glean from this was basically recurrence-free survival, cancer-specific survival for lap or open for similar size and similar state disease was extremely similar. What about money? Early on, this cost a lot more. Uh, our report from WashU in 2000, it cost an extra $2,100 to do the patient laparoscopically. Then Jeff Tadeu's group came out at UT Southwestern and showed they could save $1,000. And most recently at the AUA, Doug Dahl said, listen, if you can get the OR time well under four hours and the hospital stay at three days, you're saving $2,600. At our shop, our average OR time now is right around four hours, but the average hospital stay is only two days. Bottom line is this is very cost effective. So from an efficacy standpoint, it's equal to the open. The efficiency is a little less transperitoneal, a little better retroperitoneal than open. The equanimity is a big, big plus, and it is a plus on the economy. And I think if you look at it, the laparoscopic radical nephrectomy is the standard of care at m many, many centers uh, throughout the United States today that is, is continuing to spread. And one nice little example of this is this is the curve, if you will, for open versus laparoscopic nephrectomy at Washington University. In uh, 1997, uh, only myself and uh, Dr. Elspeth McDougall were members, if you will, of the lunatic fringe, and so there are very few radical nephrectomies being done laparoscopically. By the year 2000, the mid-2000, the lines had crossed, and I can tell you now, I was just at Washington University uh, last two weeks ago, and I can tell you that over 95% of their, their radical nephrectomies are being done laparoscopically. What does this mean? Jerry Andriol and all the other oncologists there have learned how to do laparoscopy. What about nephron sparing surgery, wedge excision, which is really coming into the fore? Why is this becoming more and more important? Before, we only used this for patients who had a solitary kidney or pre-existing renal insufficiency. But we're finding out that most of our renal cells that we find today are small. Uh, this is due to better screening. And in point of fact, 73% of all renal cells that were found in 2001 were in this 5 centimeter range. PT1 has jumped from only 8% in 89 to 43% by 2001. And I assume that even now it's much higher. The other problems we have, though, is that imaging does not equal pathology. If the lesion is less than 3.5 centimeters, you've got a 28% chance the lesion is denied. So you go in operating for cancer and you come out with a benign lesion in at least a third of the patients. So to take a whole kidney out for a benign lesion doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Similarly, we cannot make a good diagnosis by just a needle biopsy. It would be nice, but it's not working out. 
Mayo Clinic series showed it to be very inaccurate, 20% false negative, 34% false positive for a needle aspirate. So this isn't helpful. And the other thing that we began to learn is this is a nice paper from the Mayo Clinic from Horsinke's group. Basically what he pointed out was that chronic renal insufficiency doubled in the patients who had a radical nephrectomy. And this was defined by creatinine greater than 2. Now there's been a series out of the VA, a very large series, showing that yes, while the creatinine is higher in the radical nephrectomy group, the incidence of dialysis is not. But still, would you like to not have renal insufficiency? Uh, and so this has been really, really driving nephron sparing surgery. It is of interest most people have ignored the corollary, which is if you leave the kidney in, your incidence of recurrence in the ipsilateral kidney goes up sevenfold. The other thing that we've learned is you don't need a 10 millimeter margin. We always say, oh, you need at least a centimeter margin of normal tissue by the kidney, and the bottom line is that is no longer true, and probably never was true. It's never proven. Uh, the margin has shrunk down to probably about 2.5 millimeters. Zuki's paper very nicely showed that 93% of all satellite lesions were within 2.5 millimeters of the primary tumor. Uh, Resnick had a nice article on 44 patients. And again, said no recurrence if the negative was mar if the margin was negative. Their mean margin size was only two and a half millimeters, and it was as thin as 0.5 millimeters. And there have been other studies where the margin has been as thin as 0.1 millimeters, with no recurrences reported to date. If it's negative, it's negative. What about doing this with or without Hyder control? Our group has been a proponent of doing a lot of this without Hyder control. I think really what it is is it's based on the lesion. I don't think you say, oh, I'm going to do higher control in everybody, although there are places where that is what's done. I think you need to approach this, if you will, a little bit more intellectually and say, okay, let's look at the lesion. How far does it go into the parenchyma? If it goes into the parenchyma less than 10 millimeters, there's a good chance you can excise this thing, not need any huge vessels, and not get in the collecting system. If it's much deeper than 10 millimeters, well, that's a whole different story. You're going to get into some significant vessels. You're going to get into the collecting system. And for those lesions, obviously, higher control would make sense. But the vast majority of the lesions we see are, if you will, exophytic. And we have a lot of new technologies that we can bring to bear on the problem. The argon beam coagulator works very nicely. Fibrin glue, Surgicel, Flow Seal, the uh, bipolar or the monopolar tissue link, as well as microwave probes are very helpful for getting control, such as you're able to excise the lesion and not have to throw a single suture. And in our place, most of these come out with basically argon beam, the lesion comes out, fibrin glue on the base, surge cell, and fibrin glue, and that's it. Uh, Stuart Wolf reported on this, doing it hand-assisted in 39 patients, no higher control, no suturing, argon beam, and fibrin soaked gel. They had one urine leak in their series, and, it, and they transfused 10% of their patients. Reports on standard laparoscopic, uh, the largest report I could find was uh, this one from the Mayo Clinic in 2004 at the AUA. And 87% of their patients who need nephron sparing surgery, they don't do higher control. Their OR time was very short, 2.1 hours. Their blood loss was only 130 cc's. They transfused nobody. And again, a third of these were benign lesions. They did not tell you what, your, what their margin size was. Complication rate was acceptable. And unfortunately, they didn't tell you what the change in creatinine was pre-op versus post-op, which I think is more of an issue and we'll get into. At our shop at UCI, we reported on our first 12 patients that we did there. Only one of those patients required higher clamping. Bottom line is our OR time was a little longer, 3.6 hours. Blood loss, though, 116 cc's. Our average margin was 2.8 millimeters. And again, a third of these turned out to be benign lesions. The change in creatinine from pre-op creatinine to the post-op creatinine is the time of discharge, so the highest possible creatinine you would assume the patient would have was only 0.1. What about with higher control? We now have very nice laparoscopic bulldogs from Klein or Astolap, or you can use a laparoscopic Satinsky. And Indy Gill again did a very nice study looking at 100 laparoscopic partials versus 100 open that Andy Novick did. What's fascinating to me here is that the OR time for the lap was shorter than for the open. The ischemic time, though, was a little bit longer. The hospital stay was shorter, convalescence shorter. They had a few more complications in the laparoscopic group. But very nicely showing that you can do the same thing laparoscopically that a skilled surgeon can do open. But Indy clamped all of these uh, patients. 
And what was interesting to me is if you look at the seven patients in this series who had a solitary kidney, post op creatinine rose 0.5. So that's a big jump. Bertrand Guillaume at, at Sloan Kettering looked at 16 patients who clamped, 12 that did not have clamping. And what he noted was that the estimated blood loss was much higher in the clamp group, 708 cc's, which is much higher than our 116 cc's or the Mayo Clinic's 130 cc's. But no argon beam coagulator, no flow seal, no fiber and glue was used in that series. The thing that I found very interesting is the serious complications were invariably in the clamp group, and the creatinine change was tenfold different. And this is with only 27 minutes of ischemia time. I think the amount of nephrons that are being damaged with this warm ischemia time may well be underestimated. What time do you have? 40 I, you know, the thing is, and I've got a whole series of slides on that. I can show you patients who are clamped for 16 minutes and their creatinine went sky high. And I can show you other people who have been clamped for 40 minutes and their creatinine hasn't changed. And so I think there are a lot of other factors that come into it. And the problem is we cannot predict at this point in time. Um, but age seems to play a role in it. But if you look at Indy's series and you map out the things when you get the data and you look at his charts, you can have some people with a short and ischemic time of 15 or 16 minutes who are going to have a significant hit to the kidney that's going to be permanent. Other people may be 40. The literature now, there's a paper by Stoller saying, oh, at 40 minutes, everybody was fine in his series. But they don't report the individual patient. So what you really want to see is what is it for each individual patient. Because I'll bet you in that group there are a few people that did have a hit. Um, so... My gut feeling and what we're seeing is um, that I think it does make a difference as to how much ischemic time you have. What we need is a means of measuring it. We need a probe in the kidney or something like that that's going to say, okay, if you're at this point, you need to stop. You need, but we don't have that yet. So I think for the wedge, though, the efficacy is equal to the open. The efficiency is probably a negative in most hands. The equanimity is much better. No one's done a good cost accounting on this, unfortunately. So it's still evolving, but it's, it's coming down the pike. And with newer instrumentation, it's becoming easier. Five millimeter ligature all of a sudden makes the wedge a lot easier to do than it was before. And the paradigm shift, at least again from Washington University, would show that the shift here has been much slower than with radical nephrectomy. And around 2001, it, the open versus the laparoscopic was just beginning to meet. And now I'm told, and again, I, they showed another curve last week, there's a few more done, done laparoscopic than open, but the shift has not been as dramatic as it's been for radical nephrectomy. And the other thing is, I would not want to leave you with the idea that this is the end. Uh, you've got tissue ablation, needle-based therapies, and I apologize for spelling there. Um, but these are all available to you now. Most of them are cryotherapy or radiofrequency. Uh, you can do this laparoscopically, put the probe in the tumor and freeze it, but I must admit I'd much rather excise it. But the thing that's really important is if you look at the Cleveland Clinic series of 50 patients, the OR time was 2.6 hours, hospital stay only 1.8 days. They only had two patients in this series that came to nephrectomy. And then they updated their series. And what was interesting, they updated their series to show that laparoscopic partial nephrectomy was more reasonable than cryo. But when you really look at this, I come away from this saying, listen, laparoscopic cryo is better than laparoscopic partial. A little less OR time, a little less blood loss, shorter hospital stay, and a follow-up, a longer follow-up than after the laparoscopic, the recurrence rate 2.6%, about what you would expect even after an open. And so, to my eyes, this basically was the paper that favored the cryo. And then if you take it one step further and you look at Singleton's work, and now you're putting your cryo probes in percutaneously. There's no need to do it laparoscopically. He reported the AUA on 90 patients, average OR time 1.3 hours, 96% of the patients were done outpatient, follow-up at two and a half years now, and he's retreated 13%. No one's come to radical nephrectomy. No one's developed metastatic disease. That's all percutaneous work. And then there's also been a fair amount on RF, and RF has gotten a bad name because the early series showed, as um, Mike Jewett's beautiful work showed, as well as the, the, the Libertino at the Leahy Clinic, that the old RF probes didn't kill all the cancer. Now with a cool tip needle, and now they're working with, instead of a 50-watt machine, a 200-watt machine, this is out of Martin Linehan's group, and they had previously done a paper that showed that this was not working well, and then have since come out with this, this recently in the Journal of Urology, showing now at one year, their Hounsfield units are staying down very nicely, 
and I, they attribute this to using a much higher wattage and the tip of the needle is cooled so you get a further di dispersion, if you will, of the uh, energy. So these are two things to watch and I think they're going to slowly replace a lot of the partial effect of these. Everyone says, oh, geez, laparoscopy is no good because if you morselate the tumor or if you do any of these needle ablative things, you don't have any pathological staging. And in point of fact, there have been two nice articles to say that that's not needed, quite honestly. All you need to know is this. How did the patient present and what's the size of the lesion on the CT scan? And you can pl plug it into this formula and basically come out with a very good idea as to whether they're low risk or high risk. And this was uh, developed with, by Lou Cavusi and Frey Marshall at Hopkins and then was subsequently confirmed by the work of Petard with a similar formula on another 660 patients. So this represents almost 1,000 patients. And what you come away with is that if you use the formula, the recurrence risk is very low if, the, if your number from the formula is less than three, just based on what were their symptoms, did they have symptoms or not, that's a zero or a one, and what was the size of the lesion on CT scan, and all of a sudden you realize those people who are low risk based on that model have excellent uh, recurrence-free survival. And if you went with pathological staging, this number would have only 45% of the patients would have been low risk. And the clinical model, this model by Cavusi, showed that actually 79% of the patients were low risk. So the business as far as, oh, I need to know what the stage is, I need to know if it's, that really doesn't seem to hold a whole lot of water right now. Let's move on to nephrorectomy for upper tract transitional cell cancer. And again, this has been around since 1991. Uh, we were able to do that early on, and we really screwed up early on. We said, ah, oh, we, we actually went after the ureter first and then did the kidney. Wrong. We want to do the kidney first and do the ureterectomy at the end of the procedure. And we paid a price for that, or actually we never pay a price. Our patients pay a price. So we saw two patients with a recurrence just outside the bladder, which I attributed to basically leakage of urine at the time of the nephrorectomy. So the only thing I would tell you is do the kidney first. And this is an excellent case for hand assist because here you do want to know what the stage is. That's very important because if it does turn out to be invasive, these people will get chemotherapy. Uh, and then the distal ureter is done at the end. We staple this and then look in the bladder to make sure there's no tunnel left. If there's any tunnel, we'll unroof it and fulgurate it. And everyone goes, oh, you're going to get stones on the staple. Another urological shibboleth. You don't get stones on the staple. We've been doing this now for 13 years. I'm still looking for my first stone. If there are staples seen in the bladder, they just stay. They do not encrust. I had one patient who passed away just before I left St. Louis, and after 10 years of surveillance, he had one staple that was actually in the area of the urethral stump, and every time you looked in his bladder, there was that one staple, absolutely pristine. I've not seen any of these encrust in the bladder. We've been taking this further, and I've done reduction pyeloplasties with staplers, and they have not formed stones on the staple in the pelvis. Worldwide experience for over 100 cases. This takes a bit longer than the nephrectomy. On average, it's 4.7 hours. Uh, the overall recurrence rate has been about 28%. Uh, and this is transperineally. The largest series has been by Indy Gill. Laparoscopic retroperineal nephrorectomy with 60 patients compared to 35 open. Again, very short OR time for the lap, shorter than for the open, less blood loss. He converted in 4% short hospital stay. The real question is, how does this compare to open with regard to higher grade tumors? Uh, when we looked at our series at St. Louis and looked at our tumors that were greater than or equal to grade 2 and then looked at our grade 3, 4 tumors, bottom line is bladder recurrence lower in the laparoscopic group but only because the follow-up was shorter. Overall incidence of cancer-specific survival was the same between the two groups. And this is continuing to hold up. But again, this is a cancer that's less frequent than adenocarcinoma of the kidney. So the efficacy is equal. The efficiency, I really think, is usually a minus unless you're doing a lot of these. The equanimity is better. And again, no one has looked at the economy of this. The nephrorectomy is still evolving, but I think the hand assist has brought this into the realm of a lot more surgeons and is a very nice way to go and has helped decrease the OR time. What about prostate cancer? Well... Between 1991 and 1995, I had the opportunity to work with Bill Schuster, and actually Luke Kibushi and I flew down in San Antonio and did the first two laparoscopic radical prostatectomies with Dr. Schuster. And if you can imagine an operating room with Bill Schuster, myself, and Luke Kibushi in it, um, there was 
a lot of activity going on. And it was going on for a long time. It was going on for about 10 or 11 hours. Um, we did it once. The patient stayed in the hospital 10 days, had a pulmonary embolus, survived that, and went home. And then we, we flew down again, did it a second time. The patient stayed in the hospital for another 10 days. I think developed a DVT. And as a result of this experience, we basically all agreed that it's not an efficacious surgical alternative to open prostatectomy for malignancy. But as anything would have it, men of, of broader vision and more persistence were able to take things and make them work. In 1998, Gillen and Valencian pushed it. We didn't get beyond nine cases. After two cases, we said, ah, this is ridiculous, and we quit. And that's often the case, is the person who says, you know what, let's push this a little further. Let's commit to 40 cases and see where we are. And that's what they did. And after 40 cases, it became reasonable. After 20 cases, their case time began to fall. And I can guarantee you that first 20 cases were probably sheer hell. But once they got through this, things fell. And all of a sudden, they realized this was doable. And subsequently, thousands of cases now reported in the, in the literature. Average over time of four hours. Hospital stay in France and, or in Europe is five days. Catheter removal in 5.4 days. Margin positive rate reasonable. Cure, quote unquote, 96%. Condoms reported in 81% with no pads. I think this is key. I think one of the major contributions of Gillen and Valencian is that they also went after their data in a very meticulous fashion using validated questionnaires. And my feeling is as far as prostate cancer is concerned, if somebody quotes you a continence rate or a potency rate and it's not backed up with a validated questionnaire, just turn away and walk out the room because it's just nothing but total anecdote, baloney. If you're not using validated questionnaires, your data are invalid, period. And so anybody who tells me their con condense rate is whatever because their patients tell them so or that their potency is this because their patients tell them that they're potent, as far as I'm concerned, that's just baloney. Hopkins cost computer model on this. Basically, you have to get the OR time down to 2.9 hours and the hospital stay under 24 hours before this will come become cost effective. So it's, too, it's expensive now. It's more expensive than the open. And so if you look at the efficiency here, probably a minus takes longer. The effectiveness short term seems to be equal. Long term, we don't know. The equanimity seems to be equal or maybe a little bit of a plus, but again, we don't have convalescence data for these patients. patients. People haven't been pursuing that, and we don't have all the data we need on continence or coitus. And the economy is definitely a minus. And so there's no doubt that this is still evolving. And if you say, where is it evolving? It's evolving into the area of robotics. And I'm going to present just a couple minutes on this, because I think this is very important to realize what's happening in the realm with regard to robotic surgery, which is even more expensive than laparoscopic. But I think a lot of credit goes to Money Menon. And he took the robot and pushed it. And basically, he, he learned laparoscopy, and then he started doing robotics. And these are his statistics from 2003. And he compared his lap robotic to standard lap that was done by himself and either Bertrand Guino or Guy Valencian, who he had come out to Detroit, versus open done by the other surgeons at his hospital in Detroit. And all of a sudden, you begin to realize with the robot, the OR times are the same. The blood loss drops ten, almost tenfold. The positive margin rate was less. The morbidity was less. The catheters came out sooner. The hospital stay was down to 1.2 days. And 93% of these patients left the hospital in less than 24 hours. 93%. So, well, that's great, you know, because I guess it's pretty good if you can afford to bring Gillano and Valencia over to teach your laparoscopy and spend, spend months with you, and if you've got that kind of money, then maybe you can get these kind of results, but the average person doesn't have that kind of money. So, the other thing is, when looking at his results again, open versus lap robot, continence was actually better in the lap robot, and potency was actually better in his lap robot group. We asked the other question, though, is can you take a surgeon with no laparoscopic experience, who's a good open surgeon, have them sit down at the robot, and with a robotic interface, will they be able to do laparoscopic surgery and do it well? And the answer to that is yes. Tom Alling at our place uh, is our urologic oncologist, trained by Don Skinner at USC. 
bottom line, a lot of experience to open radical prostatectomy. Now he's done over 145 laparoscopic robotic prostatectomies. The first four took a little long, 7.3 hours, but by the fifth case, the OR time had dropped below five hours to stay there, and his average case time is now 3.8 hours. So the learning curve, instead of 40 cases, turns out to be maybe only five to 10 cases. The average hospital stay for these patients, 27 hours. That's the average hospital stay. Tom then went ahead and said, okay, let's put in my robotics 45 to 140 after I've gotten pretty good on the robot and compare it to my last 60 open radical prostatectomies after I've done hundreds of open radicals. Well, all an estimated blood loss drops fourfold. Hospital stay dropped in half. Continence was similar. Margin positive rate less on the robot. Why? Well, do you think somebody working at 12x magnification in a 3D field with a 30 degree lens can see better? And the answer is, yeah, they can see better. They can see better than you can see looking through an open wound with no roots. What about testis cancer? For retroperineal node dissection for stage 1 disease, Gunter Janicek in, in Austria has really popularized this along with Jans Rossweiler in Germany. A fairly large series. Bottom line is conversion rate 0 to 12%. Positive nodes in 18 to 26 percent, and all these patients, and this is always a criticism, but in Europe, all these patients are going to get two cycles of chemo if they have positive nodes. Uh, they had one recurrence, and that was a false, ne that was off of a false negative uh, node dissection, and Rossweiler's had no recurrence. Something to consider. But how about if you're looking at it for post chemotherapy? Yanitech reported great results doing this post chemo. Luke Cavusi reported on seven patients, converted 29%, complications in 57%. This is not easy stuff. And uh, Gunter, uh, obviously with experience and stuff like that, had a much better experience than Lou did. But I have to admit, I know Lou. Lou's one heck of a laparoscopic surgeon. That if he's having 43% major complications and converting 29% after chemo, that is not something that I'm going to rush into. The overall cost, it's $700 more than an open. It won't become cost effective unless your OR time is less than 3.6 hours and hospital stay under 2.2 days. But again, it's not cost effective yet. So the efficiency is probably a minus. The effectiveness short term seems to be accessible, but again, this is based on European data where all of your uh, B1 patients are getting two cycles of chemotherapy. The equanimity seems to be a plus. And the economy right now is a minus. What about bladder cancer? A uh, little work's been done in bladder cancer. The first simple cystectomy was done by Raul Parra at St. Louis University in 1992. The first radical cystectomy was done independently by Paulo Pupo in Italy and Sanchez de Badajo in Spain in 1995. And there have been these reports of small patient series. And yes, you can do this, and Indy's actually done this totally laparoscopic. But most people will basically exteriorize the bowel to do the bowel anastom to do the uh, ureteral vesicle anastomosis. And what's going on now at our place is Al Schamberg <coughs> has started doing this hand-assisted, and they'll do the the cystectomy completely standard laparoscopic, make a fan and steel incision, and then they've already done the bowel work, and then they'll bring the bowel out and do everything else above the ab abdominal wall. Long OR times hasn't been looked at really well. And I'm not sure where this is headed, um, but apparently getting better in our shop, Al now tells me he's up to about 30 of these that he's done. Um, but the data certainly are far from mature. Uh, Lenny Menon has reported two cases that he's done with the uh, robot, which seems to be another reasonable way to go. The robot is great for reconstruction, but again, possibly something else coming down the pipe, but not yet ready, if you will, for prime time. So I really, I'm looking at this, but I'm not sure where it's headed. And then lastly, if you look at all the things, I think if, for renal cancer, adenocarcinoma, I do think this is the new standard of care. For upper tract TCC, I think it's an evolving standard, but it's getting very close to being a new standard of care. Prostate cancer, it's evolving, and we need a lot better studies. But the better studies need, need to be done by people of, if you will, courage and concern, people who are truly scientists. And the true scientist, to me, really doesn't care what the result is as long as the result is true. And so we need people who are willing to do validated questionnaires. 
So you want to tell me that your retropubic prostatectomy is better than a robotic, which is better than a laparoscopic? Fine. Everybody would just get validated questionnaires, condens questionnaires, potency questionnaires. I don't care whether you use the UCLA index, the Michigan index, the SHIMS or whatever. Get them pre-op. Get them at three months, six months, and one year post-op. At the end of the year, we'd have an answer as to which is the better way to go, if at all. But nobody's doing that. Apparently, there's just been an NIH study, and I have to correct myself because I said this in St. Louis, and Jerry said there is an NIH study where they are doing exactly that. It's just so sad that it's taken so long for people to say, hey, let's look at this scientifically. As far as uh, testis cancer goes, this is very much evolving. And if you go beyond, let's say, stage one, I think it's very much investigational, which is a nice way to say very difficult and you're not going to be happy. Bladder cancer, I think, is still very much investigational. And adrenal cancer is still written about as being off limits, but nothing stays the same. Uh, I was speaking with McCall and Walter about six months ago, and they, he mentioned to me it's not been published yet, but they've done 21 laparoscopic adrenalectomies for adrenal cancer. And the recurrence rate really is no different than, quite honestly, after open, but they've had a 38% recurrence rate. So still may be off limits, but evolving. So this is your person who was actually, as far as I'm concerned, the most profound physician in, in North America. But he said this is the turn of the century. Um, I think the last century. I think it's still true at the turn of this century that diseases that harm require treatments that harm less. Our patients come to us for cure, not to be hurt. And if we've got a better way to take care of them, uh, we should immediately adopt that, that way to the best of our ability. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, what do you think in terms of the evolving role of high intensity focus ultrasound? Yeah. In terms of transcutaneous application? It's going to come. You know, it's going to come. I mean, you know, the thing is, anything that any human being can imagine, eventually, as Robert Louis Stevenson said, other men will make real. So, you know, the robot was an imagination of, uh, who was it, Capoc back in 1923 when he wrote his play. Then it came to the imagination of Isaac Asimov, and now all of a sudden it's everywhere, okay? And so the high food is the same thing. It's just a matter of people who are committed to developing it to get it proper. The biggest problem for treating an organ like the kidney is that it's going to keep on moving. And so you need a system that once you lock in on a lesion, it tracks the lesion and fires at the proper time. But they actually developed that even for shockwave lithotripsy, where with the breathing and stuff like that, or with high jet ventilation, where the diaphragms don't move at all, you could then hone in and treat it. So there's no doubt in my mind, no doubt in my mind, that within three to five years, you'll have a high-intensity focused ultrasound unit that'll be used for breast tumors, it'll be used for kidney tumors, it'll be used for other tumors uh, that are deep in the abdomen. You can treat uterine myomata that way, blah, 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 on and on and on. So anything that we're doing now, yeah, within maybe five to ten years, is going to be treated non-invasively. You know, it, truth be told, and nobody wants to hear this, but surgery is a crude way of taking care of disease. It's not technologically neat. You can put a man on the moon and bring him back 30 years ago, and you want to take an organ out that's this big, and you make an incision this big in somebody, what's going on? Our priorities have been in the wrong place. You know, as I said in the United States, if, if in the realm of surgery we had the defense budget for one year, and the defense had the medical budget for one year, A, there'd be no wars because we couldn't afford them, and B, the health care would be incredibly advanced and there'd be no more surgery. But don't worry, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Ralph, what, what's the role of what, how is it evol you know, evolving now? It's so expensive. It's a problem. It, it, yes. At what point do you step in and, and, and come up with the money and buy it before it's done to like a little yeah. computer? The problem is this, is that it, and it is. It's like a computer. Um, you know, who would have bought, let's say, the old Univac, which cost millions of dollars, filled up an entire room, and then all of a sudden now, what? You know, 20 years later, this is 10 times more powerful than the Univac and costs 100, 100 the price. Um, we sold our robot to the hospital under, under the uh, understanding that this is identified by the public, if you will, 
rightly or wrongly, as a major technological advance. That if we did not get that robot first in Orange County, our leadership as being at the forefront of technology would completely go away. And the hospital that got that would immediately become, regardless of whether it was true or not, the technology leaders in Southern California. And so, in combination with our general surgeons, our cardiothoracic surgeons, we all went ahead and we got the robot. And we share it. So it's not like it's not my toy. It doesn't stay in my room. Um, on Tuesdays, it, uh, urology uses it. On Wednesdays, it belongs to cardiothoracic. On Thursdays, it belongs to general surgery. And on Fridays, it belongs to OBGYN. Monday is an open day. And if it's not being used, then you can try and book it, but you can get bumped if you try and work on somebody else's day. And that's worked out very, very well. Um, having said that, we're not making money on the robot. Nobody in the country or the world is making money on the robot. Even Money's paper where he said, you know, we're making money on the robot, wasn't accurate. And he, in all fairness, actually pointed that out in the article because he did not take into his expenses the $100,000 a year service contract or the purchase price of the robot. Well, you throw those in, and again, it's going to be in the red. Um, but I think, you know, it's the purpose of the university. It's not only the purpose, it's the, um, it's the mandate of the university to lead in areas of education and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I think it's mandated for a university to obtain this technology, to test it, to see if it's good, and then to hopefully take it to the next step. But I hope the next step is going to be a robot that costs $100,000 and has a service contract of 10000 and a disposable use cost of $100. At that point in time, every OR in the world will probably have one. What's fascinating, I didn't show it in, in this lecture, is that if you take any surgeon and have them tie a knot laparoscopically and then have them do the same thing on the robot, they're better on the robot. If you take an expert laparoscopic surgeon, if you take Indy Gill or Bertrand Gino or anyone like that and say, okay, in the pelvic trainer, throw a suture, tie three, three knots, and then you sit them down at the robot and have them do the same thing, they do it faster on the robot. So the bottom line is man versus man plus machine, man plus machine is better than man alone. The, pro the problem is the expense. No, no, the ESOP, I mean, you know, and, and well, what's going to have to happen and what will happen eventually is, you know, if the company will eventually come out with a robot that's cheaper. And they're going to have to use a different platform than the Da Vinci. But I have no doubt in my mind that there are entrepreneurs saying, hmm, how many hospitals in the United States? How many operating rooms throughout North America? If I can make a robot cheap enough, that let's say $100,000, could I get one in every one of those hospitals? I think so. Robots being used now for some microsurgical thing. Nice paper out of uh, Goldstein's group at Cornell showing vasovisostomies in rats. Much better done with the robot. Better patency rates, lower leak rates with the robot than done by human hand. Why? Well, you got a hand that never tremors. You get 12x magnification, you have a 540 degree wrist, and you have seven degrees of freedom. It's the first surgical instrument we've ever had, short of putting your hand in the wound, that has seven degrees of freedom. But you still need a laparoscopic surgeon in the room at the table, even though a robotic surgeon is over there. You need somebody who can get a pneumoperitoneum and put in port. Yeah, but, you know, somebody's active at the table. But does that need to be an expert laparoscopic surgeon? No. It needs to be somebody who, you know, can put it, a varus needle in, get a pneumoperitoneum, put the ports in, and work off of the screen. We're not talking high-tech laparoscopic. Tom and Money, they all have experts. good Fellows are residents. I know, but they're good laparoscopic We have one assistant who works with Tom, and that may be Luke Eichel, who's a fellow, or it may turn out to be one of our chief residents. And we have more and more of our chief residents sitting down at the console. All of our residents have taken our laparoscopic course and are certified to work on the robot. 
I mean, anastomosis and stuff like that is getting passed along now. You know, but you don't need a world-class laparoscopic surgeon at the table. As a matter of fact, you may be hindered by that. I tell people the reason that Tom's first four cases took so long was that I was his table-side laparoscopic surgeon. And I was always going to, Tom, what's that? What's that? You sure you want to cut that? You know, and, and I slowed him down. And after the fourth case, David Lee came in, and all of a sudden the OR time dropped from seven and a half hours to five hours. So I slowed him down. Yeah. What's fascinating to me is that along those lines, the very first case that Tom and I did together um, took us about seven and a half hours, at the end of which I was beat to a pulp because I was the table-side laparoscopic surgeon, and so I'm like this and like that, and your, your unusual contorted angles get in between the arms. And if Tom moves suddenly and I didn't move quick enough, you get cold cocked by the, the robotic arm. And so at the end of seven and a half hours of this, I was just beat to a pulp. And I'm sitting there going, damn, I've just been here a year. I convinced the hospital to buy a million dollar piece of equipment. I feel like crap. And I have to believe that my oncologist is going to get up from that console, look at me and go, never again. And walk out of the room and I'm going to need to find another job. You know, and so at the end of this, Tom got up from the console. I said, Tom, I'm sorry it took so long. I know you can do these cases in under three hours. He said, no, this is great. And he looked great. He looked great. He had no shoes on. He had no mask. He had no gloves. He had no gown. And he looked fresh as a daisy. And he said, oh, this is great. I said, what do you mean it's great? He said, well, I've never seen anatomy as well as I saw it today. And I think that's why you can do a better job. I really believe that you're seeing things that you normally don't see. And I've been trying to convince people like Pat Walsh to just sit down. I have no doubt that Pat Walsh could sit down at, at a robot and do a laparoscopic radical prostatectomy, probably in under five hours first time out. And that he would be ecstatic. But he won't do it. He won't do it. Some people are scared. Some people are scared. But, you know, it is amazing what you can see. And it's true. With the 30-degree lens there, you're seeing the, the, the muscles come off the levator. You're seeing muscle slips come into the urethra that you're able to spare now that you never would see before because you're also working at 12x magnification. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see what how Tom's data come out in the, in the long run. But he is doing the pre-op and post-op validated questionnaires. And we'll see what he's got. I'm very interested about this NIH study coming out that, that people are doing this because we'll get an answer within 12 months about coitus incontinence. So, but yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I just wish that the robot were cheaper. I really do. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's regrettable that the two companies doing this have now merged. So basically there's a monopoly. And so I'm not sure what's going to happen. So. Yeah. Um, in the advent of offering laparoscopic temporary redirection, have you thought that there may be a reduced tendency to rely on nephron clearing memory based of options of redirection and protection? No. Uh, it's an interesting question. You know, but no. I mean, I guess in our shop, what's happened now is we look at upper tract cancer the same way we look at bladder cancer. So, would anybody take out the bladder for a grade one non invasive tumor? No. So why should I do it for an upper tract tumor? The answer is only access. Well, if I can provide you access to the upper tract as easy as you can have access to the bladder, would you then treat the two diseases the same? The answer is yes. Well, I can do that. How? We cut the distal ureter. So if we go up and we've got a grade one or two lesion that's non-invasive, we'll treat it. And at the end of the case, I'll basically cut the ureter halfway up from the UO halfway up the tunnel so it refluxes. And now when they come to my office, I do flexible cystoscopy. I put a guide wire up under endoscopic control, not fluoroscopic, take out my cystoscope, pass my flexible ureter scope over the guide wire, it goes up the ureter and look in their kidney. No IV sedation, no oral valium, 
nothing. And you just waltz up there and you just sort of look around. I've got a template of the kidney that I've created so I know how many calyces I need to get into. And you just walk around the kidney just like you were examining a bladder. I have not had a single patient that I've done that in who's ever said to me, Doc, it hurts. Doc, I want medication or I don't want you to do this again. Not one. So, grade one to two, non-invasive, just treated the same way you would treat the bladder. If it's grade three or four, it needs to come out. You know, and, and an endoscopic solution there is not going to be any good, as, any better than it would be in the bladder, which is usually no good. So, it's changed the, the thinking. So, Ralph, you make your cut. Twelve o'clock. Just halfway up. You know what I like to do is, <coughs> yeah. What I'll often do is I'll put up a uh, like a ureteral, a five millimeter ureteral dilating balloon, and you can fill that with a little endocarmine stained saline. So now you've got this blue balloon that stretched the ureter out, so it's nice and stretched. And then I'll take an Orandi knife, or you can use a Collins knife, and I'll decide where I want to end, and that's where I start. So I go from the mid portion of that tunnel and cut back to the UO. That way I don't get into the trap of saying, well, I need a little bit more, I need a little bit more. Because if you cut it up too high and you get into the intramural portion of the ureter, that may actually scar down with time. So I just make sure it's that. And that's how you start, you start where you want to finish and come and go down. From an oncology point of view with the prostate, so one of the comments that I heard was that money in particular uses so much cautery that the pathology is really the same cause of margins because of that. And but one reason why the margin rates is remar were remarkably low. And secondly, that it's patient selection. Right. We all know. And you know, if you're going to choose small, low grade C1C, then. Right. Everything. I think the, the key thing is you need to compare your low risk patients, the margin positive rates in your low risk patients. So that's what Tom did. He took his low risk patients from his open days and compared them to his quote unquote clinically low risk patients in his robotic days. And that's where those margin rates came from. And that was on step sectioning the gland. The problem I have with Money's data is that if they have a quote unquote positive margin on the gland, he says he would take some random biopsies and if those are negative, he calls them margin negative. And can't do that. Not fair. And the bottom line is is that if you've got a positive margin, it's a positive margin. Um, I think Tom is playing the grain pretty straight, and he's, he is an oncologist, and um, those, those are his most recent data where he actually has a lower margin positive rate robotically than he had when he was still at open. Certainly not the difference that money shows. No, not the difference. No, and there, there's, you know, the thing is, you know, any, results from any individual are always what I consider a scientific phenomenon, and until somebody else is able to duplicate those results, they remain a phenomenon. And maybe the guy is a master or a magician or whatever, but if he's a master or a magician or whatever, and the results can't be duplicated, then all of his work is not science, it's not education, it's entertainment. Because when the magician dies, the trick goes away. So that's of no benefit to mankind. What is of benefit is doing things teaching them and having other people being able to not only duplicate your results, but perhaps get better results than you got, then that's a contribution. And then that's something you can believe in. So I much prefer the latter scenario. I, I, I don't have much time for magicians. No, I, I must say that it was, it was Tom's paper where he mentioned 11 cases in a learning curve that I think was as significant as any of stirring the interest in the robot. So Tom is, is yeah. yeah. I mean, Tom is as honest as the day is long. Um, you know, he's a no no baloney kind of guy. He's going to tell you what he's got. And he's just going to move on. He doesn't care what his results are. He's just going to touch what's real and then just move on. It's like you know, it's like Harry Truman said. You know, I I never gave anybody hell. I just told them the situation. They thought it was hell. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh